Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to have an old-fashioned Bible study here at the chapel, and we'd love for you to join us. We're going to pick it up today in Ezra chapter 6, verse 1. Ezra, I'll remind you one more time, if you translate it rather than transliterate, it means help. And God sent this Ezra to help the people of Judah come out of Babylon, out of confusion, if you will. And things were rocking along pretty good, but then they hit some roadblocks. You know, Satan likes to throw roadblocks when God's work is being accomplished. He doesn't want that work to be accomplished. And for 15 years, the building of the temple was put on hold. And Haggai, the prophet, and the minor prophet, God uh, sent to the people of Judah. And he basically told them, you know, you're building your own fancy, comfortable houses, but you're letting the house of God sit over here waste. And, you know, you're, you sow a lot, but you bring in very little. You eat, but you're not satisfied. You drink wine, but there's not enough ever. And you, those of you who do make wages, you bring it home and put it in a bag with holes in it. And what Haggai was telling them was, you're not being blessed, and you're not being blessed for a reason. Uh, consider your ways, is what Haggai said. Five times he said that in two chapters. I'm talking about the minor prophet of the book, Haggai. But uh, in our last lecture, we had uh, Tatne, the governor over uh, the whole area, Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah, was subordinate to Tatnai. And Tatnai and his, his uh, cohorts showed up and said, who gave you guys permission to rebuild this temple and this wall? Uh, because they were starting to see some progress again. And uh, the people of Judah wrote a letter uh, to uh, Darius, king of Persia, and said, you know, Cyrus, king of Persia, gave us permission to rebuild the temple. In fact, he commanded us to return to Judah and rebuild the temple. And that's who gave us the authority, and others have been throwing bricks in, in, in our path ever since. So uh, that's where we pick it up in chapter 6. We're going to see uh, Darius's response to the people of Judah's uh, letter saying, you know, we have good reason to be rebuilding this temple. Uh, Cyrus, king of Persian, gave us that permission. So let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Bring your children out of confusion with your word. We pick it up with chapter 6, verse 1, and it reads, Then Darius, this is Darius Histopsis, the king, the king of Persia, made a decree, and search was made in the house of the rolls, where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. The treasures, no doubt, uh, utilized to keep gold, silver, precious metals, uh, jewels. But also we see something here that books, uh, or they're called rolls here, and at this time they actually wrote on scrolls made out of papyrus or some of them even made out of leather. And, but we can see here that the books were important to them as well, that they were kept in treasuries with the other precious items. Verse 2, And there was found at Akmetha, in the palace that is in the province of the Medes, a roll, and therein was a record thus written. Akmetha, many of you with reference Bibles have a reference that this is the same as Ekbatana. Ekbatana is an ancient capital of the Medes. 
and there are many, many ancient coins that have Ekbatana engraved on them. Verse 3, in the first year of Cyrus, the king, the same Cyrus, the king made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Let the house be builded, the place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height th thereof threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof threescore cubits. Now, a cubit, uh, depending on whose measure of cubit you went by, has varying lengths. Uh, in some nations at this time of the world, whoever was the king, they measured the distance between his elbow and the tip of his middle finger, and that was the cubit for as long as he was, he was the king. And then when a new king came in, the length of the cubit changed because obviously not all men have the same distance between their elbow and the tip of their middle finger. Uh, I'd say a good average to go by would be 24 inches. It's actually 18 to 25 inches, but 24 inches makes it easy figuring. Uh, so uh, two foot for cubit, uh, three score cubits in height, that would be uh, 60 times two, 120 feet in height, and then three score cubits in breadth, that would be 60 cubits, 120 cubits in uh, uh, width as well. So, and, and in comparison to Solomon's temple, the, the height of Solomon's temple was only 30 cubits, so it was half of what this structure that they're uh, going to build here would be. Uh, on the other hand, on the breadth of the original temple of Solomon, it was 20 cubits uh, compared to 60, so it was three times as wide as Solomon's temple. Now, you have to understand too, though, that it was not nearly as extravagant as Solomon's temple. Why? Well, they simply didn't have the resources, the gold that it would take to redo Solomon's temple. Uh, it was very, very extravagant. Verse 4, with three rows, you could think of these as three stories uh, of great stones and a row of new timber and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. Now these rows we're talking about. Now Solomon's temple also had three stories of build rooms on each side of the main sanctuary of the temple. And then this uh, new timber, a row of new timber, was the, the flooring between the stories, in other words. And notice Cyrus said, I don't want the delay of the temple to happen and whatever resources it takes to build the house of God, if you remember he asked the neighbors back in chapter 1 to give to the people, the Hebrews of Judah, if they could. And many of them were very generous, uh, not only with uh, precious metals, but with livestock, or animals, etc. But he's saying if whatever they need, take it out of the king's treasury. That's uh, uh, very generous of Cyrus, verse 5. And also let the golden and silver vessels of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took forth out of the temple, which is at Jerusalem, and brought unto Babylon. He restored and brought again unto the temple, which is at Jerusalem, every one to his place, and placed them in the house of of God. So here's an instance where the Lord giveth, the Lord took away, and the Lord gave again. These vessels are written of in Daniel uh, chapter 5 verse 2. Belshazzar, the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon when the captivity began, uh, Belshazzar and about a thousand of his friends were on a toot uh, they were having a party deluxe, and a, it was a drunk. Uh, Belshazzar ordered that these cups be brought, and they started drinking and toasting to the god of gold, the god of uh, silver, no doubt, to the god of wine. 
It, it angered our Heavenly Father. You remember what happened there in Daniel chapter 5. A man's hand, or what appeared to be a man's hand, wrote on the wall, many, many tekel you farsen, which means God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. You've been weighed in the balances and found lacking. I'm going to divide your kingdom and give it to the Medes and the Persians. Uh, Cyrus, first of all, the king of Persia, defeated the Babylonians, and Darius, of course, maintained control. Uh, the Persians were in control at this time. Babylon totally defeated. Verse 6. Now, therefore, Tatnai, governor beyond the river, Sheth Bar uh, Boznai, who's thought to be his secretary, and your companions, the Aphrosakites, this is a, a Medo-Persian region that was on the same side of the Euphrates as Judah, which are beyond the river, be ye far from thence. Now what he's saying here is stay away from Jerusalem. Don't cause the temple to be delayed any further. And uh, when Darius put something in writing, uh, that, that it stood. You know, he was probably the most powerful man in the world at this time. Tatney was the governor, but he was appointed uh, by Cyrus, king of Persia, or Darius, king of Persia. He's saying, leave the people alone and give them what they need to finish the temple, as we'll see. Verse 7, let the work of this house of God alone let the governor of the Jews, the governor of Judah, which was Zerubbabel, and the elders of the Jews, of Judah again, build this house of God in his place. Now we see God totally in control here. You see, it didn't matter that Tatnai didn't want the house of God built. It didn't matter that the Samaritans did not want the house of God to be built. It didn't matter that Cyrus changed his mind and wrote a second letter call, it's telling, calling on the people of Judah to cease the building of the temple. Uh, God said the house is going to be built, and as you know, what God says goes. Uh, Darius was a very powerful man. Uh, he's nothing uh, compared to our Heavenly Father. And we can see the same thing in the world today. Uh, world leaders come and go. But be aware that no leader of any nation is in his position or her position without God having placed them there. Our Heavenly Father is in control. Verse 8, Moreover, I, this is Darius speaking, make a decree. Now, this is a new decree coming from the king of Persia, Darius. What ye shall do to the elders of these Jews for the building of this house of God, that of the king's goods, even of the tribute beyond the river, forthwith or promptly expenses be given unto these men, that they be not hindered. This word hindered in the Chaldee, which is what these chapters, I'll remind you, from chapter 4 through chapter uh, 6, verse 18, are written in Syriac or Chaldee. This word hindered in the Chaldee is made to cease. So don't uh, cause the work on the temple to come to a halt. If they run out of money, you take the money, Tatnai, out of the tribute that would have normally come to me. Uh, so he, he's financing, he's putting his money where his mouth is, is what is being said in these verses. Verse 9, And that which they have need of, both young bullocks and rams and lambs, for the burnt offerings of the God of heaven, wheat, salt, wine, and oil, according to the appointment of the priest which are at Jerusalem, let it be given them day by day without fail. Now, uh, this would be, you see here, they call him the God of heaven. Uh, the Persians would have no problem uh, recognizing Yahweh 
the God of heaven, as they're calling him here. Be why? Because they had multiple gods. They had a god of uh, the night, a god of the day, a god of the winter, a god of the mountains. Uh, you name it, they had it. And one was just as good and just as important as the other to them. Uh, this is not to be imply that there was a conversion on the part of Darius. It's simply saying that Darius is saying, yeah, there is a God of heaven. Uh, you guys need to be worshiping him. But, and I like this. Give them whatever they need, not only to build the temple, but to reestablish the worship of the Lord through the sacrifices. And what a contrast to how things were when Haggai had to reprove uh, the people of Judah. And now, instead of saying, you sow and you bring in little, here they can say, you sow and you bring in a lot. Uh, you eat and you're filled and satisfied. You drink wine and you, you're satisfied. And when you, those of you who make wages, take it home and put it in a bag without holes in it. Uh, God can fill your bucket God can put holes in your bucket. And what determines which way it is? What you do. If, if you serve the Lord and are pleasing to Him, then He fills your bucket. If you're displeasing Him and you're not trying to do things His way, He can put holes in your bucket. I mean, you can work yourself to death and you'll have nothing to show for it whatsoever. What a contrast. A full bucket or a bucket with holes in it. Uh, the people of Judah are starting to do things God's way. Uh, they followed Haggai's instructions to consider their ways. And what that meant was, you remember in our last lecture, we went to Haggai. That means to consider your conduct and the results or the consequences. Your conduct has consequences. Please God, be blessed. Don't please God, be cursed. Verse 10, that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and his sons. He's wanting a little something in return for his generosity. He's saying, have them say a little prayer for me and my sons, the heirs to the throne. If you have an Apocrypha, there's a book called the Book of Maccabees. Uh, also in Josephus, the Book of Antiquities, it's written, uh, Josephus, if you're not aware, he wasn't, a, uh, he didn't write any part of the Bible, any book of the Bible, but he was a historian and a well thought of biblical historian. And he wrote, and so does the Book of Maccabees record that the people of Judah did set aside a day that they specifically prayed uh, for the king, in this case the king of Persia and his sons. And you know there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, as I said a moment ago, there isn't a ruler over a nation uh, that wasn't placed there by God. And perhaps you don't agree with the policies of the leader of the nation where you live in, for example. What should you do? Pray for the leaders. There's nothing wrong with praying for the leaders. If nothing else, pray that God changes their mind to carry out policies that are closer uh, to what you think is right. Verse 11, also I have made a decree that whosoever shall alter this word uh, let timber be pulled down from his house, and being set up, let him be hanged thereon, and let his house be made a dunghill for this. Very strong threat from Darius. Darius was known for making such threats, though. He made a similar threat. There's a, a rock called the Behistun Rock, if you have a companion Bible, make a note of Appendix 57. And Darius made a very similar threat uh, to those who went against his plans uh, on the Behistun rock. Now this tearing timber 
uh, pulled down from his house and being set up. What this is talking about is uh, they would take a pole or a large beam from someone's home, uh, tear it down, and then set the pole or the beam up and crucify the person on it. Uh, the Syrians were well known for taking a pole and sharpening the end of it and then impaling the victim on it. Uh, the, the Persians, on the other hand, were one of the first nations uh, to nail the victim to the cross, such as the Romans uh, crucified the, the technique, the method that they used. Verse 12, and the God that hath caused his name to dwell there, destroy all kings and people that shall put to their hand to alter, and this is with the figurative ellipsis here, it means to, uh, means to alter this decree, his writing, and to destroy this house of God, which is at Jerusalem. I, Darius, have made a decree, let it be done with speed. I don't think we'll see any more objections from Tatnai uh, or the Samaritans uh, or any of the other nations who are concerned that Judah might once again become strengthened and stop paying tribute to uh, Darius who was maintaining them at the time. Verse 13, Then Tatnai, governor on this side the river, uh, Shethar Bozni, his secretary, and their companions, according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. It was, yes, sir, yes, king, we'll get right on that, sir. And the elders of the Jews builded, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido, the grandson actually of Ido, and they builded and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the commandment of Cyrus. I like the order of those commands. And Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. And I'll remind you once again, Artaxerxes is a, an appellative, which is a common noun such as uh, one that's well known is uh, every king of Egypt is called Pharaoh, and Pharaoh is an appellative for the king of Egypt. Our taxerces, an appellative for the great king of Persia. In other words, it could apply to Darius, uh, who was king of Persia. It could apply to Cyrus, who was king of Persia, and all the other kings of Persia. Makes it rather difficult sometimes to keep up with which uh, king of Persia is being talked about in the Bible uh, if it doesn't say which one it is. I like this. The, the people of Judah prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Ido. The word of God brings people out of Babylon. It brings people out of confusion. Uh, Haggai had, you know, Haggai didn't sugarcoat anything. If he saw something that he didn't think was right, he said so. And, and the Lord said it through him on many occasions. But Haggai told the people, look what you're doing. You're running to build your own houses, fancy cedar inlaid uh, comfortable homes, and my house, the house of God, lies in waste. Consider your ways. Consider your conduct and the consequences. Verse 15, and this house was finished on the third day of the month Adar, Adar the twelfth month on the Hebrew calendar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. So altogether probably close to 20 years, uh, con taking into consideration the 15 years that nothing was done toward the building, the rebuilding of the temple. So uh, Solomon's temple took only seven and a half years and to construct, and it was a whole lot more uh, fancy than the temple that the people of Judah. But, but once again, uh, people could walk by, the people of Judah, Benjamin, and the Levites, 
They could walk by Mount Zion and see that temple there. And it must have been a really uh, emotional, uh, spiritual thing for the people uh, to witness. Verse 16. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. It was a very joyous time that the house of God, uh, after 70 years of captivity and a, a hard journey back to their homeland uh, to see the temple established and the worship of the Lord reestablished. That's what brings blessings is when you do things God's way. Verse 17, and offered at the dedication of this house of God an hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel, twelve he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. And anytime we talk about burnt offerings for the sake of our younger audience, I'll, I'm, I, I need to remind you that. Uh, burnt offerings today would not please your heavenly Father. He doesn't want your burnt offerings anymore. He wants your mercy, your love, as it's written in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. When I began the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, I mentioned that by rightly dividing the word, we have to consider that Ezra and Nehemiah 99% concern Judah Benjamin and Levi. Here we see the uh, thought of the people of Judah toward their flesh and blood, the total 12 tribes. You see, at this time, the 10 northern tribes were in captivity to the Assyrian, but they remembered their brethren and offered an he goat for each of the 12 tribes, the, the natural seed line, all 12 tribes the descendants of Jacob, verse 18. And they set the priest in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. And that is where the Syriac uh, Chaldee language ends in the manuscripts. Uh, verse 19 picks up back with the Hebrew language. Now, these divisions that this verse talks about, uh, you can read about in Numbers chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, and Numbers chapter 8, verse 9. But uh, Levi, the uh, son of Jacob, had three sons, Kohath, Kohath uh, Gershon, and Merari. And each of those uh, divisions of the priesthood had different uh, functions that were specifically assigned to that family. Uh, and that's what they're talking about, that those were reestablished. Now, the courses for the priest, uh, those were established in the time of David. And there were 24 courses of the priest. And what would happen is they, the course would last from Sabbath to Sabbath, one week, in other words and they would cycle through. Uh, the, the, all the Levites didn't live in Jerusalem. They were scattered throughout Judea. And once their course came due, they would go to Jerusalem and take care of their assigned duties for that week. Then they went back home and they'd cycle through these 24 courses, weeks, and then start over again. And then all of the priests served at the three major ingatherings, Passover, uh, the Feast of Weeks, later uh, called uh, Pentecost, and then the final uh, in major ingathering, the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 19, And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the fourteenth day of the first month, Adar being the twelfth month, uh, of course, following that would be the first month, Abib on the Hebrew calendar. Uh, the, the year began at the spring equinox uh, in the Hebrew calendar based on solar, not lunar. And on, you count 14 days and then at sundown evening was the beginning of the 15th day, 
which was the Passover. Verse 20, For the priest and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure. In other words, they had taken measures to cleanse themselves, and they had also avoided any defilement that probably occurred from uh, the dedication of the new temple in the twelfth month all the way through to the Passover. And killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity, all those who came out of Babylon, and for their brethren the priest, and for themselves. Now, uh, what this is talking about is that uh, for those who weren't of the priesthood, and they were in an unclean state, they could not kill their own Passover lamb or goat. In that case, the Levites would do that for them. Now, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, we learn that Jesus Christ became our Passover. Just as the Passover lamb of Exodus chapter 12, the blood of that lamb caused the death angel to pass over uh, the houses of the Hebrews, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ uh, causes the death angel to pass over us and gives us eternal life. Verse 21, And the children of Israel, which were come again out of captivity, and all such as had departed, separated, excuse me, themselves unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord of Israel, did eat. They ate the Passover lamb or goat. Either was acceptable according to Exodus chapter 12. And what this is saying is they separated themselves from the heathen uh, Gentile practices of the surrounding neighbors, uh, the kingdoms that were up against them, and the Samaritans, uh, which were located north of Judah. Verse 22, And kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. And that was a holy convocation. The Lord... Uh, word was read by the priest to the people, and that is how you come out of confusion. That's how you come out of Babylon, my friend, is hearing the word of God. For the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria, that's referring to Darius. You may recall in an earlier chapter, Cyrus was called the king of Babylon, and rightfully so because his people had defeated the Babylonians, uh, the Persians had also defeated the Assyrians, uh, therefore Darius is called the king of Assyria, unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of God, the God of Israel. And uh, things were going well. Why? Because they were following what the prophet Haggai and the prophet Zechariah said, consider your ways. You know, you can do the same thing in your life today. If it seems like you're working hard and not getting anywhere, you might want to do a little self-analysis. And the question you should ask yourself is, am I pleasing my Heavenly Father? And that's a good question to ask. And if you are, you can be assured of His promises, His blessings. But if you're not, you can be assured of His promises, the cursings. He can either fill your bucket uh, with plenty or he can put holes in your bucket to where it seems like you're working your head off for absolutely nothing. I'll ask you to consider your ways. We have a short message. We ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. 
You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us here at the Shepherd's Chapel. Uh, if you've got a biblical question, we've got the 800 number there, 800-643-4645. Uh, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual uh, denomination or organization by name. We teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others by name, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. And it's always good to hear from you around the world. You know, uh, the internet is interesting. We uh, occasionally run reports that show where in the world our program is being hit from. And it's always, it's not surprising to me, but uh, oftentimes where you have heavy concentrations of U.S. troops, uh, the Koreas, for example, um, Germany, for example, uh, you, you see a lot of hits from those areas. But the, what never ceases to amaze me is that uh, the first uh, highest number of hits is, of course, the United States. The second highest number of hits is uh, Canada, but number three, you very consistently, is China. And that, that does surprise me, but uh, people are hungry for the Word of God around the world. Now, we do, if you have a prayer request, we can do away with the 800 number. Uh, take it up with your Heavenly Father. Uh, he's there 24-7 for you, and I, I assure you, you're not... Uh, faced with a lot of competition these days. People are too busy for God. They, they get so busy and wrapped up in their lives, they, they don't talk to their Heavenly Father. Uh, you talk to Him and it's very pleasing to Him. It makes His day. We do come to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask that you look upon these. You know their needs, Father. Uh, problems with marriages, uh, financial difficulties, you know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. And we ask always lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Watch over, guide, direct, protect, touch, and heal in Jesus' precious name. Amen and thank you, Father. Let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have Eva in Alabama. When God returns and we are changed in the blink of an eye, will we be of one gender, male and female? Yes, I believe so. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, verse 29, uh, the Pharisees and scribes are trying to trip Christ up there. And they say, you know, this guy was married to this woman and he died before he raised up any seed to her, before they had any children. Uh, her, his brother, which is, was law at the time, took her to wife. He didn't have any children with her. This went on seven times, and she didn't have any children with any of them. And they said, when they get to heaven, which one of those seven is going to be her husband in heaven? And Jesus answered him, said, you know, you do err, and you don't understand the power of God. For in the resurrection, in other words, after this life in the flesh, there's neither, they don't marry. It's sort of like the angels. They don't marry. They don't give in marriage. They don't take in marriage. And if you think about it spiritually, Eva, you know, who is the bridegroom at that point in time? It's Jesus Christ. And who is the bride? We are the bride of Christ. So, and spiritually, you could think of it that we'll all be female. Uh, the bride is usually considered female. Uh, Thomas in Indiana, question for Pastor Dennis Murray. Did we all know the Adam, our Lord Jesus Christ, in the first earth age, or will we meet him for the first time when we stand before our Lord Jesus after we pass from this world by death 
or uh, of our earthly body. Uh, I believe we will all recognize him. Why? Because he's been from the very beginning and we were in spiritual bodies before we were born from above, uh, which is what born again in John chapter three, uh, verse three and verse five is talking about. Uh, you have to be born from above or you can't enter the kingdom of God. You see, the fallen angels refused to be born from above. They refused to be born of woman and they left their habitation in heaven and came to earth they saw the daughters of Adam. You can read about all this in Genesis chapter 6. And they went into them and uh, there were children born. There were Geber in the Hebrew giants. But yeah, Jesus has been from the beginning. Uh, he's right now at the right hand of God. So uh, I think we'll recognize him. Uh, you know, our memories have been wiped clean as we enter this flesh body. Why? That's the whole purpose of this earth age is God didn't want to destroy the third of his children who worshiped or joined in with the Satan at Satan's rebellion in the first earth age. <clears throat> James in Arkansas, is there such a thing as three heavens? Uh, Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 2 in the following verses, Paul speaking in the third person says, you know, I knew a man uh, in Christ over 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, but God knoweth such and one caught up to the third heaven. And that, that verse throws a lot of people. A lot of people go, a third heaven? Well, where was the first and second heaven? And they're not understanding the scripture. What that's talking about is a heaven age, not a location, a period of time. And you know, if you don't understand the three earth ages and the three heaven ages, you're never going to understand all of God's word in its entirety. Uh, Paul would write in the New Testament, the mystery of God. And God's word remains a mystery to those who don't understand the three world ages. Martha in Tennessee, seems like everyone I know that's prosperous believes in the rapture. Why do they seem to have everything? The only answer I can come up with is the devil causes them to prosper so that others will see them and follow their lead. Can this be why they do so well? Well, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, I'm going to point out to you, Martha, and it states there to lay up your treasures. Uh, and do not lay up treasures for yourself here on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves can break in and steal. But lay up your, your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor thief will corrupt. And that's the teaching of God's word. You know, because somebody's prosperous here in the flesh doesn't mean that they're pleasing to God. You know, there are many, you can be intelligent and, and wise in the ways of the world and get prosper and, and be wealthy, but that doesn't get you anything in heaven. You know, uh, that, that's the, uh, it's harder for uh, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And that's a figure of speech. Uh, it has to do with when they had walled cities and at night they closed the main gate off to the side or in the main gate, there was a needle gate and it came to a point at the top, thus the name a needle gate. And when travelers came in after dark, they had the gate closed for security, but they had to unload the camels to get them through the smaller narrow gate. And that's what the figure of speech is that a rich man has to unload his ill-gotten gains before he can enter the kingdom of God. 
Deborah in New Jersey, why are people so far apart on their belief in the rapture? One side believes so strongly while the other side does also. People who believe uh, in the rapture theory uh, like to hold on to their security blanket. Uh, they don't want a preacher to tell them the truth that Antichrist comes and he's gonna, we're gonna be here while the Antichrist is here. They want that security blanket that they're gonna fly away and be gone. Uh, they would rather have a preacher who sugarcoats things and says things that they want to hear. They ignore scripture that tells us Jesus is returning here. Acts chapter one, verse 11. Jesus is coming here, we're not going uh, to meet him. Thomas in Wyoming, uh, why do I feel that God has forgotten me or deserted me? Well, I'd say, Thomas, you probably uh, are lacking in faith if you believe that. How do you increase your faith? Uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 17 tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, if, you, if you believe in God and have faith in Him, you know He will never leave you, He will never forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, oh, along about verse 2, 3, 4, 5. Peggy in Alabama, is tithe done before paying bills or after? Tithe means 10%. Uh, to me, that means 10% of your take-home pay. You don't pay 10% of your gross, you pay 10% of your take home because uh, Uncle Sam likes to get his share of your income, the state likes to get uh, their share, or most states charge income tax. But let me say this, uh, Christians pay their bills. You know, if it comes down to you paying your rent or paying a 10% tithe, you should pay your rent first. Then, if you pay all your bills and you still you don't have an, you don't have ten percent left to tithe, then make an offering. You know God understands your situation, and uh, the the main thing is to get out from under usury, uh, where you're paying interest and you end up paying two or three times uh, the 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 value of something because you're paying for it on a credit card. Uh, that's putting your wages in a bag with holes in it uh, because you you know you're, you're you're paying two or three times what something should be paid. You follow when someone preaches God's word and leads people to the Lord is that a form of tithing? No, I don't think uh, teaching or preaching could be considered a tithe. C. L. N. the priests, uh, the Levites when the, the law was established in the book of Numbers, they were to pay a tithe as well, 10%. So uh, that kind of answers your question there. CL in Virginia, is it written anywhere in the Apocrypha that Joseph is the biological father of Jesus Christ? No, because he wasn't. Uh, Jesus was the only begotten son of, our, of God. John chapter 3 verse 16 states as much. And you know, a lot, it, it, I can't understand why people look at the genealogy of Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and think that that's the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Joseph didn't have anything to do with the conception of Jesus Christ. That was between uh, the Holy Spirit our, our Heavenly Father and Mary, the mother of Jesus. You'll find the genealogy leading up to Christ, which is Mary's genealogy in Luke chapter 3. <clears throat> Martha in Michigan, will our Father forgive us more than once if we happen to backslide? Well, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, uh, Peter asked Jesus, he said, Lord, how often should I forgive a brother that transgress against me, that sins against me? Seven times? And the Lord said, no, seven times, 70 times. 
490 times. So uh, as long as you mean it and repent, uh, God forgives. Barbara in California, how is it that Saul missed Christ's first advent? Where was Saul when Christ was here? Saul was uh, dragging Christians out of churches and uh, persecuting them, throwing them in jail. Uh, that was until he was struck down on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. Uh, then he went on to write most of the New Testament. Uh, John in California, when Christ comes back, will I be in my spiritual body? Yes, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, and the following verses, at the last trump, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Ben in California, where in the Bible can I read about bringing in a Christmas tree uh, into our home at Christmas? Well, I like to quote Hosea chapter 14, verse 8, where God states, I am like a green fir tree. I am a green fir tree, uh, which means evergreen, uh, ever living, if you will. Um, you know, I believe the conception day of Jesus Christ is definitely something that we should celebrate. Uh, I'm afraid that some people use a little bit of knowledge that birth date of Christ was not on December 25th, it was his conception date, and he was born on September 29th. Now, if you do that, you know, consider your children and, and allow them to celebrate the conception of Jesus Christ. I fear that if you tell your children, you know, we don't celebrate Christmas because it's against our religion. I'll tell you what, when your children see other children getting presents on Christmas and uh, eating well and celebrating, singing Christmas carols, uh, they're gonna grow to dislike their, your religion is what's gonna happen. So uh, encourage your kids, you know, teach your kids that we're not celebrating the birth of Jesus we're celebrating the conception of Jesus. But again, that's something to celebrate. The Word became flesh. So, um, by the way, we'll be airing a program uh, one, one week from this broadcast uh, that is entitled Christmas. And it goes into the conception day, the birth day, it takes you biblically through so that you can understand when Christ was actually born. So be watching for that. I hope you'll enjoy it. I hope each and every one of you has a very Merry Christmas. Angel in North Carolina, should you pray every day or is that too much? And should you only pray in church? You can pray as often as you wish. Uh, you know, the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And he answered them, and you, in Matthew chapter 6. And it states there in verse 5 of Matthew 6, when you pray, don't pray in the, excuse me, in the synagogues as the hypocrites do. A synagogue is another word for a church. Or on the street corners to be seen of men but rather go into a closet, a private place, and talk to your Heavenly Father. Nothing wrong with praying together with the congregation in church, but when you want one-on-one -on -one with your Heavenly Father, go into a private place. Lindsay from Tennessee. I have heard the senior Pastor Murray, that's Pastor Arnold Murray, say numerous times that the elect can be identified by their compassion for others. Am I beyond salvage if I struggle with compassion for people but am innately tender-hearted toward animals? Let me preface, preface my, by saying my heart breaks for those who suffer and our troops and others who are in harm's way. I just struggle with warm, fuzzy feelings for the public at large on a daily basis. I believe courtesy and polite manners are important and it seems like so many folks out there are self-absorbed, narcissistic, and downright rude. 
I often find myself feeling more irritated than loving toward my fellow man. Each time I hear an old broadcast from Pastor Murray mentions compassion in the elect, it makes me realize I must not be one. I do pray for more empathy and try to work on it, but I think I must be flawed. Well, you know, sometimes compassion, uh, uh, Lindsay, is getting out a two before and whacking somebody up the side of the head. I'm not talking physically, I'm talking spiritually, to get their attention. Uh, kind of like Haggai did, you remember? He said, consider your ways. Maybe that's what you should do to these brothers and sisters that are, you say are, are all self-absorbed. You know, say, hey, you know, you're so self-absorbed in yourself, you're forgetting your heavenly Father. Sometimes uh, correcting people is a compassionate thing to do. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, and the following verses, it states there that God only chastens those that he loves. Dennis from Missouri, where in the Bible is once you repent, your sins are buried in the deepest part of the sea? If you have a Bible that says that, I can promise you it's not a King James Version Bible. However, Acts chapter 3, verse 19 states that once you repent, your sins are blotted out. That means that it's like if you had something written in pencil and then you erase it and you wipe away the, the refuse, it's gone. It it's never was there and God doesn't want to hear about it anymore. I'm out of time. I love you all. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in depth. It makes His day when He sees you reading the letter He wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings if we've helped you. Help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others as well. One thing that's most important though, beloved, it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.